Uh, in this video, I will talk to you a little bit about the approach of viewing the uh, market value of equity as a call option on the value of a firm's assets. Um, this is the last of our approaches, and it's a bit different than the others, uh, so I sort of saved it for last. If you think about what we've done in the past, we've basically focused with the other approaches, discounted cash flow, dividend discount, for example, on cash flows to equity owners um, of the firm in some way, and what those will be going out to forever. And then we've, we've really focused in on an expected path for what they're gonna be. So you would have one growth rate, for example, and just say that that's what it's gonna be. And to the extent that you thought that there was some uncertainty around that, you would deal with that in the discount rate, or you would assume that it's being dealt with in the discount rate through uh, cap M. And so you wouldn't really address it directly. And then you just take these cash flows and you would discount them back to present value to get the current equity value or stock price. Uh, and of course, we use the, the um, um, present value of perpetuity approach in all of those to where you don't have to really build out all the cash flows and stuff. But the key is it's really focused on cash flows, goes out to forever, and then discounts the values back. And so if you thought about how you might do that in a previous approach, you might say, oh, let's just say I've got $10 million in cash flows this year, grows at 8% a year. So by next year, it'll be um, 10,800,000, grows every year after that at 8%, got an 18% discount rate. Let's just say we got that from our cap M. And so when we uh, take that $10 million cash flow and we put it into our discounted cash flow model using the price of value of perpetuity, we wind up with $108 million value. So that's the value of the firm because that's all the cash flows, not just the equity cash flows in this particular example. Um, we subtract out the value of the debt. Um, the value of the debt is 50, so that leaves us with a market value of equity of 58 million. So that's sort of, if you'd taken sort of an enterprise value approach to this or a, a net income approach to this, that might be a way to do it, so. Um, so, uh, again, in this approach, we go a little bit differently. Instead of focusing on cash flows, we, at, we focus on what the current asset value of the firm is, right? And then we focus on thinking about what that current asset value might be in the future, and in particular, on the date when we would retire the last issue, outstanding issue of debt. Um, now... Instead of focusing on sort of a single expected value, we recognize that there may be an infinite number of possible um, scenarios for, for future value in the future. So if you think of the, the path of how things get to the future value uh, when the debt is retired, um, you know, some years it can go up, some down, some a lot, some a little, uh, and then the next year it'll do something different. And so really there can be thousands of potential future values of assets out there. Um, for each of those values, uh, future, future value of assets, um, you know, under this approach, you would deduct the cost that, it, that is required to retire the debt at face value um, when it retires. Um, and not just the debt, we should say, but basically any sort of a, a claim that is preferred above common equity. And so, um, you know, as an example, preferred stock. Uh, you, can't, you can't liquidate and pay common stock until you've paid preferred stock, and so uh, you would want to make sure that that, that was uh, paid off as well. Um, and so key element here is that for all those possible future values, there are going to be some of those um, where the equity, where, where the value of the equity is not even enough to pay off, or the asset is not even enough to pay off the debt. Uh, and so this approach is the only one that recognizes those scenarios and the fact that as a residual owner, the equity holders um, have a limited liability. If there is not enough asset value to pay off the debt, the equity holders don't have to come out of pocket for more money. They simply walk away. And so there are some of those scenarios where there, there are multiple of those scenarios where the value of the assets is less than the value of the debt um, and the equity holders get zero. They don't get a negative amount. 
and then in every other scenario they get some positive number. So there's no scenario where they get negative values, only the positive values. And so then conceptually with the approach you would take all of the values, either zero or positive values, and you discount them back to present value. And theoretically you might do that at the risk-free rate because um, you've already sort of addressed risk through your probability distribution. Uh, and so you discount them all back, you basically average them all out based on their likelihood of occurring, and that give you your value of equity. Okay, now that's a, that's a daunting approach when you think about it that way, going through all the scenarios. And so I want to give you a little bit of an idea of, of conceptually what's implied by that. I've put together an example, um, assuming a market value now of $100 million. Um, debt expires in four years, and so each year um, the value of the assets could go up by 40%, or it could go up by 8%, or it could go down by 32%. And there's an equal probability of each of those outcomes. And so think about what the possible values at the end of year four are. Well, the way you would go about that, quite simply, is you would start out, in case here's all your numbers, start out in year zero with your 100 million. And you'd say, okay, well, there's scenario one, scenario two, scenario three. And each of those is just the 100 million times one plus whatever your growth rate assumption is. So obviously in this case, one plus minus 32 is equal to 0.68, so 68%, so you're, you're going down in value. So that gets you your year one value. When you go out to year two, you now have to take each of those year one values and do the same thing again. So now you've got nine possible outcomes by year two. Go out to year three, got to take the year two values and do the same thing again. So there's actually 27 possible values out there. And you can see you're starting to get a range, 274 here, 31 down here. So anywhere from 31 million to 274 million. Now, if you thought about the probability of that, let's see, it's a one-third probability here, one-third of that's one-ninth, one-third of that's that. So there's, again, there's 27 outcomes. So 127th, uh, so that would be like a, a little less than a 4% probability there. You get out to, to year four, you got a lot. And I'm gonna shrink this down for a second so you can just get an idea of what that branching looks like. Each of these boxes was the year three. You got three of them, um, kind of reflecting the fact that you're going out one more step. Uh, and so you got you know, technically 91 of these, or 81 of these things, okay? So that means each one of these has a probability of occurring of about one and a quarter percent, just not a lot. Um, and you see you got values, I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger. So you know, at the top you got values going up to almost 300 million, at the bottom you got values going down to you know, around 20 million. So it's pretty wide range. Um, and it takes a lot, you know, imagine you had a company that had 10 years worth of, of uh, debt and you know, or 10 years of maturity on their debt and so you had to go out 10 years and you wanted to consider more scenarios than these this thing would just blow up like crazy and so while conceptually it's a really useful approach uh, practically it's just very hard to use and so instead when you start doing this um, we rely on probability theory to really think in terms of the distribution of what the asset values at the end of year four will be and so Here's an example of something like that. Now, again, it's not perfect. Um, I would never really expect asset values to go negative, um, but it's fairly representative. Uh, in this case, the 100 million we start with, 30 million annual vol volatility actually pretty well corresponds to the 40%, um, 8%, um, minus 32% that, that we used in the example, 6% um, growth rate, Four percent, four years to maturity, and so you can see, even though you start out at 100 million, um, the middle of this is bigger than 100 million to reflect the fact that we expect it on average to grow. So the whole thing's sort of moving to the right, and every year you do this, it's going to get wider. Okay, um, and so just think of that as if somebody said to you, um, "Give me some idea, sort of a probability distribution of what you thought the future asset values would be." Um, the market value of assets would be four years from now, um, you know, that might be what you would come up with, all right? 
So we start with that and then we make one additional thing here, which is we add to it the face value of the debt. Now, we do this because if you think, again, as we talked about before, equity has a residual claim on the assets of the firm. So in four years, if the assets of the firm wind up here in the positive, you would, let's say it's at $100 million, you'd liquidate them, get your $100 million, pay off the $50 million, you'd still have some left, still have $50 million left, and so in that scenario you'd make money. But what if the asset value was out here at, say, $20 million? Uh, not very likely it's going to happen, but if it's $20 million, liquidate the firm, give the $20 million to debt holders. They don't get any more. The equity holders don't have to pay anything off. Uh, and so the equity holders get zero. And so even though the distribution looks like, oh, you know, there's all this going on out here, in reality, equity holders only hold this stuff to the right of the debt line, right? And so, um, you know, this these values at these probabilities... So they aren't responsible for 100% of the scenarios, only the ones that um, are to the, to the right of the debt. So when you look at the picture that way, and this is kind of how this option model came up, you know, some bright guys basically said, you know what, um, that picture looks remarkably like the picture we use to describe the call option on a stock. And so on a call option on a stock, the owner of the stock of the option basically so you go buy the option and it gives you the right but not the obligation uh, at some point in the future to purchase the stock at some pre-agreed price called the strike price and so you would buy at that price and the, and notionally the idea is you would only want to do that if the market price was higher than that price because then you could buy at the strike price sell at the market price and make the difference and so as an example here Let's just say that we have a stock that's currently at $20, but that it, you know, a year from now, the likely range of that stock price is sort of shown by this distribution. And that you've entered into an agreement that says um, you have the right but not the obligation to buy at $15, the stock at $15 in the future, so a year from now. So if the stock goes down and let's say that it's only $10, um, because you have the right but not the obligation, you just don't exercise the stock, and therefore your payoff is zero. However, if the stock price is, say, 20, you go exercise your option. It gives you the right to buy it at 15, and you could turn around and sell it into the market right then for $20 and make 5 bucks. And so that's kind of the way that option would work. And for the call options on a stock, um, somebody had already basically developed a model called the Black-Scholes model, for how you would estimate the value of that option. And in our example, with those inputs, they would have estimated a value of $5.93. Now, the reason you have to pay for an option in this case is because when you buy it, it basically guarantees you that you'll never lose money, you'll only make money. So it's valuable, and so you, you would be willing to pay for it, okay? Um, how does that map over to our equity situation? Well, if you think about the equity owner rights to the residual, uh, and I'm going to bump this up again, apologize, didn't even notice that. The current market value of the assets can be thought of as the current stock price. The annual volatility for that market value of the assets is the same as the volatility on the stock price. The growth rate in the assets, which is usually, again, typically assumed to be six, uh, the, the risk-free rate, um, kind of equals the risk-free rate uh, on the stock price. The amount required to pay off the debt um, replaces the strike price, right? Uh, and so, um, I, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you, you do have to think of this not just as the debt, but also maybe preferred stock. Basically, any claim that, that has preference in bankruptcy over common equity and so has to be paid off before the equity holders get paid. Uh, would be included in this, but you would just say the strike price is we got to pay all those guys off and then whatever's left we get to keep. The time to maturity on the debt um, or the duration is usually what's actually used. That's a concept we'll deal with later. Replaces the years to exercise. And so there's sort of a replacement in the valuation for all of those. And if you were to plug that in and say, oh, so current value of 100 
uh, million annual volatility, 30 million growth rate, 6% years to maturity on the debt four, face value of the debt 50. In our example, that would have come up and said the value of the equity is 60, about $61.6 million. Uh, and so you can use the formula to actually get a value. A um, couple of things that I want to point out as benefits of this before we go picking on it too much. Uh, it's true that firms rarely track the market value of their assets on an annual basis and report that out. It's always book value. But uh, since the market value of the assets is basically equal to the market value of equity plus the market value of debt, which we know to be enterprise value, uh, it is possible to go out and find the enterprise value. Uh, and so uh, since that's available all the time, you could plug enterprise value in, and you could also go look historically at enterprise value and get an idea of the historical volatility and use that as an input. Uh, and also because the option valuation already accounts for risk through the use of a probability distribution, um, you don't have to go out and find a growth rate and a discount rate and all those sorts of things. Uh, the model just simply requires you to plug in the risk-free rate for a treasury security that's at the same maturity as your debt. And so in that sense, it's kind of interesting because it really, you know, a lot of those things that we were assuming in the other models, um, those go away. And so some people would say, oh, this is awesome. We can actually use this. Here's the gotcha. Biggest gotcha on this basically is just because you know the historical volatility of the enterprise value, you may not know the future volatility. Uh, again, particularly if the, the firm is changing its uh, um, risk profile, it's going for either more risky or less risky types of projects in the future. Um, similarly, uh, you know, we've seen this in other situations with stocks and other kinds of uh, um, options where um, the implied volatility, so the volatility that would make sense given the price of the option um, that you solve, you know, that is observed in the market, the, the volatility is the only unobserved input, as we noted. So you can basically plug everything in and solve for what must the volatility be in order to justify that price. And they tend to always be a little bit higher than the historicals. And so... Um, I guess over time, you could probably sort of figure out what's going on with those implied volatilities and, and have a thought on that. But if you just started out sort of naively and took the historical um, volatility on enterprise value, that's probably not going to be your best route. Um, also, the, uh, you know, as we noted, firms typically do have multiple debt issues maturing at different dates. Um, this approach... Um, would, would want to address that uh, in some way. And it's not really built to easily address it because um, you're assuming a growing asset value. And again, since asset is equity and liability or is equal to equity plus liabilities, if you go pay off some of your liabilities, you, you're reducing your asset. You're taking cash out, using it to pay down the liability. Um, and so you're, you're driving down the value of your, your um, cash at points in time. And these are known. These aren't like random uncertainties. And so there's a bit more complexity in how you deal with the, um, this valuation for companies that have multiple debt issues. And since many or most of them do, that's a, that's a bit of a problem. Um, also, the option valuation model that we use, this Black-Scholes option model, has certain other assumptions that are in, that, that are used to derive and justify the model that aren't necessarily true in this case. Doesn't mean that it's not a reasonably good prediction, but does draw into question in certain situations whether it makes sense. Um, the, it assumes that the underlying assets of the firm can be replicated, traded, or hedged. Um, it would be really hard to for any individual firm to um, either replicate or hedge or trade a portfolio that exactly replicates the the uh, the assets of the firm and what they'll do in the future in terms of their value. Um, changes in the value in the assets over time may, may not be continuous. Uh, the Black-Scholes model assumes that, that the value changes sort of smoothly 
in some direction, you know, every instantaneously, sort of every minute. Um, we can't observe that. It may actually do that, but we can't observe it. Um, more importantly, um, you know, this, these tend to be very long dated options. Uh, they may go out for 10 years while you're waiting for the debt to mature or even longer. And so the, the specific kind of mathematical statistical um, definition of continuous that we're looking for there could easily be violated during that period. And as we've always already noted, sort of this a similar issue that just the volatility that we're seeing right now or that we've seen historically on the value of the assets may not resain, remain the same over the life of the option. And that would certainly be true if you also then had to in, you know, put this debt issue uh, into it. And then lastly, the equity owners would, you know, under the Black-Scholes option on the date that the debt expires, they ought to be able to go out that day, convert the equity, the assets into cash, pay off the debt, and uh, everybody be happy. But um, number one, the equity owners may not want to liquidate on that day. And so just because they can doesn't mean they should. Um, but more importantly, they probably would not be able to. If you consider um, a firm and the assets of a firm, and that's businesses and all sorts of things, um, a lot of times it takes months and maybe even years to liquidate the, the assets of a firm. And so that technically violates the assumption of Black Scholes. Now, these are important to note so that if you get a, a result that's very, very off um, from what you're seeing in the market, it's perhaps one of these things that, that is really making a difference. And so you want to look at them. But again, what most folks have found that is for the kind of average well-functioning, you know, not distressed firm, um, this actually does not do a bad job of estimating the market values. Big thing here is to talk about the insights. And I'm going to flip over here in a minute back to the uh, spreadsheet uh, that I used to calculate this and show you some of this. And I will give you that spreadsheet. But um, there are some really interesting insights here that are completely different, maybe contradict the other valuation approaches. The big one that everybody points to is that in this model, when you increase the volatility of future asset values, so you put in a higher volatility, you're going to make that, that distribution wider of the potential values, which by definition makes, actually makes the firm more risky. That actually increases the value of your equity instead of reducing it. And the logic there is um, that equity holders are actually incented to take the risk because if it goes badly, they don't have to pay the loss. The debt holders have to eat it. And if it goes well, they get the benefit um, from taking the, the risk and, you know, maybe having those long shots out there. And they don't have to share, you know, uh, any extra with the debt holders. And so... It actually, most people believe that is the way that, that managers think, and that's the way equity holders encourage them to think. Um, and so, you know, this was a real big aha. If you think about the discount models, what they would all basically say is, look, if it doesn't improve the expected value, and all it does is increase the riskiness, then the value of the stock should go down. And interestingly, we don't see that most of the time when the riskiness, uh, the, the, the risky bets that the firm takes increases, um, we see the equity values in the short term go up. Um, another sort of aha, the value of equity does decrease whenever you add more debt, but at less than a one to one rate. And so um, kind of what that says is, is that there is a there is a reason why equity holders like the company to take on more debt. By taking on more debt, that's money that they can use to make their bets. Yes, it makes the firm more risky, but again, um, if for some reason the uh, um, you know the the bet doesn't pay off, then it's the debt holders that are stuck holding the bag, not the equity holders. And so, um, you know, there there are some benefits um, to additional debt. Now, I know it says the equity value decreases, and it does. The total value of equity decreases. But if you envision that they're taking some of this debt and, and replacing equity with it, right, um, then, then you could imagine that the, um, per, the, the value per share is going up. 
Um, that's a bit more complex sort of calculus to do with that, but uh, again, an interesting insight. Um, as the value of the equity in, it will increase as the maturity of the debt increases. And so the longer it, 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 time you have before you have to pay off the debt, the more the value of the equity is. And again, the intuition there is that's that much more time for things to go right. Now, we all understand that that also means it's that much more time for things to go wrong. But once again, when they go wrong, um, it's the, the debt holders that have to pay the, the brunt of that, not us. Uh, and so, uh, quite frankly, we, we would look at that and basically say more time is more valuable for us as equity holders. And the value of equity increases as the risk-free rate increases. So again, all of the other discount models, uh, basically, you, know, you would assume that, that built in, think of the cap M, that built into the cap M is this notion that as the risk-free rate increases, that the um, required return, the discount rate's going to increase, all other things being equal, and, uh, and that's going to drive down the value of stock, with, stock. Whereas in this model, what it says that as the risk-free rate increases, the value of equity should increase because... The risk-free rate is also used as a proxy for the rate at which the value of assets increase. And again, there's a, there's a big macroeconomic explanation for that that basically says that the overall um, assets of the, of the economy have to be growing at, at um, a rate you know, that, that, that is similar to, that is justified by the risk-free rate. Um, it, you know, otherwise... Uh, the risk-free rate can't be sustained. It would just be um, you know, not possible. And really what it comes down to is, is if we think the risk-free rate is sort of a real rate that we need just for time value of money um, plus an inflation rate, it's basically saying that on average the value of, of all of the assets in the economy can't grow any faster than the average inflation, inflation rate. Uh, and so whenever the risk-free rate increases, that must mean that the inflation rate has increased. Um, if it's decreased, same thing. And so that should also inflect, impact the growth of the, uh, the asset values. And so anyway, at the end of the day, that's sort of implied by that. I want to flip over to for you real quick to the model and just show you kind of how you could test some of that stuff. You're going back to this back tab call option of equity. Uh, and so if you, you know, if you just started putting in there uh, different, I think what we originally had was a face value of debt of 50 million. Um, so that got us 78.56 when it was at 70, which we used in the, the uh, deal. That was 71.72. I forget what was actually in there. It might have been 40. No idea. 6% um, might have been in there. 50. I don't remember. We can, we can go back and look. Let's see. The, uh, the spread had 10, 36, 4, and 50. 10, 36. Ah, who was that? 4 and 50. There we go. So we had raised the maturity. Just my last one playing around with it. Sorry about that. So again, you can just go in and change each one of these things. Make this 110. And sure enough, it goes up. And we would expect that. Every model goes up when you you change the underlying value, right? If the cash flows go up, all of the models would predict that. But if we change the volatility from say $30 to $40, if you look down here, you'll see this just got wider, okay? So it got wider, but interestingly, as it got wider, you there's actually more area to the right of this than to the left on a probability basis. And so the value of the equity goes up a little bit. Let's drop it back down to 30. It's not a lot. It's subtle. Uh, when the growth rate goes up, what it does is basically shift all, everything to the right in terms of future value. So let's go take it to 10. All right. Shifts that stuff back to the left. I'm going to do something here. Maybe that's going to make this a little bit better. I'm going to format this axis. And we're going to fix it at, um, we're going to fix it at 0. And the maximum we're going to fix at, let's call it 400 million. Okay. The reason I do that is uh, that when we do that, then then everything 
shifts left to right. You'll see that here in a second. So here, again, the axis all stayed the same. So when you go from 6% to 10%, you just see everything shift over. There's a lot less uh, in the range of the debt, right? There's a lot more out here, and so significantly improves the value. If you wanted to increase the maturity, you're just giving it more time to get where it needs to go. And so again, that's substantially improving the value. Um, so you can drop that back down. Well, what do we have that at four, I think? Um, it, moving the face value of the debt is just, just going to shift this line. Okay, so we might move it from 50 to say 80. Now, key thing to watch there is we've added 30 million in debt. And so let's see how much the value of the equity goes down. Okay, instead of going from 61 to 31, it went from 61 to 42. We didn't lose nearly as much of the value as we thought we would, right? Um, and yeah, it shifted it over. Um, again, we were at what, 50, I think. So it's just shifting the line, right? But it's not one for one because it's all probability weighted. So. By shifting the line, we've made all of this turn into zeros, right? And all of this is still positive. Um, so uh, those are kind of the insights, and those are some examples. I would certainly encourage you guys to play around with it. Again, I will put the, uh, the model out there for you to pay, play around with. Uh, make sure I've reset it back to kind of where it was here. Um, but uh, I, you know, I will tell you that generally speaking, um, this was considered to be a groundbreaking um, intuition, um, thinking of this as an option. And, and quite frankly, I think most of the really um, cutting edge, I guess I would say, um, strategies as it relates to uh, management seem to be driven off of um, really recognizing this option valuation. So anyway, I hope you guys find that useful. Thanks.